So God, if your fifth commandment is, you shall not kill, why are you always asking people in the Bible to go and kill people? That seems awful weird to me. shall not kill. What does this mean? Here's what Luther says from his small catechism. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body or his person, but rather help and support him in every physical need. God forbids you to take the life of another person or your own life. God created life and God wants that life to keep going. It is not for you to end that life. This really gets back to the greatest commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Shouldn't kill each other because, hey, you pretty much enjoy your life. So, how do you love someone else? By taking care of them, protecting and preserving their lives. One of the greatest stories in the Bible about this is King David. King David uh, lusts after the wife of another man, Uriah, one of the generals in his army. And in order to have Uriah's wife, King David schemes to have Uriah go to the front battle lines of the war that Israel was waging at the time in order that Uriah would be killed. Now, even though King David does not wield the blade that kills Uriah himself, it is King David's actions that have Uriah killed. Therefore, King David himself is the murderer. God reacts to this by sending Nathan, the prophet, to King David. And King David, through a story that Nathan tells, realizes the tremendous wrong that he has done by having the general Uriah killed. King David suffers greatly as a result of his sin, but repents and writes Psalm 51 as a prayer of repentance. And God forgives him. But it's not just killing. It's not just killing. It's not just beating someone until they cease to be alive. No, it's everything leading up to that. It's harming someone in any way. It's uh, calling them names so that they feel like they're hurting on the inside. They're emotionally hurt, mentally hurt, psychologically hurt. That's akin to murder. It's teasing people and poking fun at them. It's uh, bullying. It's all those things that detracts from life and takes life away from people. That is forbidden in this commandment. You shall not kill. In fact, Jesus talks about this he says, whenever you harbor hate in your heart towards your brother or sister, you're breaking this commandment. Whenever we make someone else's life bitter, whenever we take life and livelihood and the, the, the savor of living from them, we're breaking this commandment, you shall not kill. Because we're killing them partially, even though we're not killing them fully. What if somebody wrongs us? What if somebody does an injustice towards us? What then? Are we supposed to just let it go by? Are we supposed to just let, let it happen without doing something back to them, punishing them, getting back at them, taking our vengeance? Well, the Bible clearly says that this is not our job. This is St. Paul in Romans chapter 12. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. 
we are never the ones who are in the position to exact justice from someone else by hurting them, by hitting them back. In fact, what Jesus says is says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, you aren't to hit them back, rather you are to offer the other cheek. That's a hard word for us to hear, especially when we want to get even. So ultimately, this commandment is a commandment against anger and hatred, against wrath that we have, grudges that we have against our brothers and sisters, against other people in the world. God forbids that because from that comes the physical outward manifestations that lead to things like actual murder, assaults, uh, fights, and things of that nature. This is what Jesus says. I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, this is from 1 John. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life with God. There you go. That's what's forbidden. Even hatred itself. What about all these times where God um, orders the people of Israel to go in and and wage war against other cities. You can't read the book of Joshua or Judges without um, seeing this happening. Or the armies of King David defeating the enemies of Israel. Uh, The story of Samson where he knocks down the house of the Philistines and it falls and kills all the leaders of the Philistines. Or King David killing uh, Goliath at the battle with the, the sling and the stone. What's going on there? God gives the authority to take another human life to governments. In fact, this is what Paul writes about it in Romans. They are God's servants to do you good. If you do wrong, you should be afraid. For the government does not bear the sword for nothing. Rather, the government is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment to the wrongdoer. God has put authorities in charge in order to protect the innocent. And that's what God is doing in all those uh, situations in the Bible where God orders armies or individuals to go and bring justice. They're not doing it out of their own anger. They're not doing it out of their own selfishness. They're not doing it out of their own motivations. Rather, they're doing it to protect other people and preserve their lives, to further God's mission on this earth. And it is always as, as its ultimate purpose is to bring peace and wholeness uh, rather than to create disorder. We see the prime example of this is, the, is World War II. The allied countries got together in order to stop uh, Nazi Germany and Hitler's regime from murdering uh, the people there and taking over all of Europe in order to set people free and protect the innocent. In that situation, in order to restrain evil, it was necessary to go and kill the armies and destroy the armies of Nazi Germany and its allies. Otherwise, evil would have been unrestrained. But that is by far the exception and always must be done carefully and by people and representatives of society by those put in the authority to do that thing. For instance, police officers. They are publicly accountable and trained persons that we have given the power to kill other people in order to protect the innocent. And they're held publicly accountable for that. So in this commandment, what is God asking us to do? What is the requirements of us in this commandment? Here it is, again from Paul. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Jesus says, love your enemies. If you hate someone, pray for them. If they curse you, bless them. That's what we, that's what we are to do. We are to love. So even if someone does something against us, God is commanding us to be kind, to be gentle, to be merciful, to control our anger, and show love, forgiveness, 
and grace to other people, just as God has shown that to us. That's what we ought to do. That is what is God is commanding us in this commandment. Furthermore, we ought to avoid habits and practices that harm our bodies, and we ought to help other people uh, avoid habits and practices that harm them. And rather, we should do things that are healthy for us, and we should help other people to do things that are healthy for them. So, basically, this is a commandment commanding us to eat right and exercise, because that is protecting and preserving our life and the life of other people. Who knew that God was commanding you to, to do what your doctor had been recommending all along? All right, guys. We'll see you this Sunday. Take care.